My name is uh, Emil Dendok. I'm the owner of the Turin Private Cellar. We've been here about 20 years now and been making wine for 15 years. Uh, we never came here with the intention of making wine, but a couple of things happened and we then found out it was not just the view here, but also the position of the property was ideal for making some of the best red wines in the, in the country. And once we stumbled onto that fact, um, I got involved with um, one of the big winemakers in the country and said to him, look, uh, we've now found out that we've got uh, some great terroir here. Can you help us make wine? And from there, the whole concept started of making wine here. One of the phenomenal parts of what happened to us, uh, you know, there's a great load of luck in, in what happened to us. But having decided on the wine and then planting the vineyards to the wine uh, was a totally different concept to anywhere else in the world. So we started with the wine and then went to the university and then worked backwards uh, into the vineyard and say, now how can we build and plant a really complex wine? So we went to great lengths uh, in analyzing the soils. We found 15 different soil types. We matched soil types to cultivars. We matched rootstocks to soil types to cultivars. And we planted over 25 clones over the five varieties to really start building complexity straight into the vineyard. Uh, and I think that plan uh, and that focus that we had, which is foreign to what is usually done, uh, made the big difference for us. I, I did some research into the market, uh, looked at what parts of the market were still growing, and then looked at um, Bordeaux and said, Bordeaux has been doing a great job for 300 years, why reinvent the wheel? Let's just bring those five varieties to South Africa and let's see how they perform. And obviously they're performing extremely well. For those in the know of Bordeaux, the Garonne River runs through Bordeaux. And on the left side of the river, the government has decreed over 300 years that those wines will be dominated by Cabernet Sauvignon. And on Pomerol Saint-Emilion, those wines are Merlot and Cabernet Franc driven and effectively known then as the right bank. Right. And, and we have both vineyards on our property. So we have a, a cooler south-facing vineyard, very similar to the right bank. And by default, we started with the left bank. I was a drinker of uh, red wine. Um, and yes, then started focusing on Bordeaux and started learning. And before we started making the first wine, I decided to, to visit Bordeaux and went to Vin Expo and then really started falling in love with the concept. We stumbled on some research where uh, we practice what we call diva viticulture. And uh, by picking some spots within the vineyard with near infrared aerial imaging, we then start cultivating those wines individually. So 600 vines are set apart, and then we remove all the grapes, but four bunches, so the plant can focus all its energy on those four bunches. And then we hand manicure those bunches. Uh, so if there's a little green berry in the bunch, we will remove that by hand. Everybody wears surgical gloves. We remove all leaves around the bunch zone so there's 100% sun exposure. And we really ripen those until 25% of the bunch is turned into uh, raisins. Then we would come in hand harvest, uh, again with surgical gloves, four bunches in a tray. We rush those trays up into the cellar and then we would hand de stem and select the berries we want and discard the berries we don't want. And then those berries are uh, put into specially designed oak, new oak barrels um, and we ferment in the oak barrel at a very high temperature. And the interesting thing here is the winemaker sleeps in the cellar at that stage because every barrel has to be turned every two hours four or five times. And what happens is you get absolute total absorption of the skins. They actually break up uh, and you get a hugely concentrated wine with this beautiful velvet wine that comes out of there. The wine is submitted to 200% new oak and the oak is just sucked into the wine and you never know that there is 200% new oak in the wine. But yes, expensive to make, but an absolute taste sensation. Yes. If you are not on the edge all the time. How can you make the cutting edge wine? So we have to test and, and uh, we've had a couple of scary moments where uh, we had stuck fermentations and those kind of things. Um, so yes, uh, it is totally on the edge. That's the whole lot gone, uh, but it will not kill us because uh, 
the mainstay of the brand uh, is the two wines in front of me. And that is what it's all about. And as I said, it was really developed uh, to improve these two wines. And we've learned such a lot out of that experiment that we're now bringing into these two wines. At the end, when the first wine was made, we had to taste the wine. And I tasted this wine and I was no expert at that stage. And I just said, I had never tasted anything like this before. And then we decided on the positioning that we will go top end of the market, develop the packaging according to what we thought the positioning would be. And it was interesting when uh, I circulated the wine to the wine masters in this country, uh, we got some very average uh, comments back. Because South Africa is also totally inwardly focused, so they compare everything to what they're tasting in South Africa, and the world palate is not open uh, to them. Not that it was open to me either, but then we entered the International Wine and Spirits Competition, gold medal, Parker gave it 90 points, and all of a sudden South Africa woke up and said, oh, is that the profile that the world is looking for? And we were on top of the wave uh, immediately, and the secret now is just to stay there. I, I think South Africa has got some unique problems. We don't have any huge producers making big volumes of wine, making a name for the country. Uh, so I think the niche for South Africa lies in these smaller producers making small quantities of really excellent wines. And if that can be portrayed to the world and change the image of us uh, exporting huge loads of uh, cheap bulk wine and actually become the garagists of the world. No, it's amazing. Uh, most people think that we're totally export-driven, but we sell 50% of our wine in South Africa. And uh, the taste profile is universally accepted. So I've just come back from China and the people love the wine there. The same in the United States, Europe, Sweden, uh, Belgium. Uh, in, in the Netherlands, we are in 60% of the Michelin star restaurants. So uh, a very wide variety of people who really like the profile of what we're producing. We're playing with some interest, uh, little interesting things, but uh, not planting anything new or doing anything new. Uh, but there's like a wine that we brought out called La Jeunesse Delicate, which is from the drawn down juice of Malbec that we make a rosé and then we blend back 50% uh, oak aged Merlot and Cabernet Sauvignon and making a light red wine that is served slightly chilled, which is ideal for South African conditions for, sure. for the islands around us and that sort of thing. And that is just running, running crazily. If you ask me again, I probably wouldn't do it again. It was uh, such high risk, but in the end, it turned out to be uh, some really good return on it, uh, but, but totally focused.